My ninth grade year, I was I was selling crack for about a year, and I sold crack because I, would, I would, used to hang out on the like blocks with my friends, and like they would be out there like making money, and it's like so quick and easy. Somebody come up, you give them something, you just like watch yourself, and you get like hundreds on top of hundreds of dollars. And now I go to University of Pennsylvania, man. It's crazy when I when I think about that. It's like you go from selling literally crack on a corner to being at an elite Ivy League world class like institution. Never imagined being a part of that space. So just like growing up, I I felt like that I, I faced a, a somewhat large amount of adversity uh, just coming from the neighborhood that I uh, grew up in, which was over on 52nd and Half and, and a lot of people refer to it as like the dark side of West Philly. West Philadelphia is one of many communities inside Philadelphia as a whole that's just been had, well, that it just had its light, lights cut off. Like, it's one of the many neighborhoods that's been marginalized, that's been disinvested in, that's just been forgotten about. It's like a type of forgotten land. It's so economically, like, drained that the people in there are <sighs> scrambling for survival, if that makes sense. I would say that West Philly was a place where I always tell people that I really grew up at because I felt like that I had like some really transformative like experiences, both bad and good around here. Uh, sometimes even life threatening. Uh, you know, just from like selling drugs on the street, uh, to just getting involved in the things that I should never have been involved in. Uh, it's, it's a lot of crack dealers around here. You don't you don't really see like a a wide variety of drugs. It's like mostly like weed and crack. Uh, and I used to sell crack when I was younger in high school. The, the heavy concentration of drugs around here. And at one point I was a part of the problem because I didn't see like the broader, broader like implications for not only like myself, but the community I was in. And I kind of look at people who, who do sell drugs around here as in a way, like kind of poisoning uh, the community in, in, a, in a way.
I started hanging out up 60th Street where uh, I kind of got more so into like the, the robbery scene and we like ransacked a couple people houses, like some drug dealers that we knew around the neighborhood. We was watching their house and they slipped up and we went in there and took one time it was this guy he lived on. What was that? 60th and Sansom. 60th and Sansom, his name was Q. He was like this this pimp dude. He had like prostitutes in his house that he that he like handled, that he pimp. <laughs> he was like a drug dealer and um my friends knew him. And they was just like, yo, he out for the week and like let's he got all these flat screen TVs, all these PlayStation computers, and they got heroin in there. Let's take it, we could get some bread off that heroin. So my dad, he sold mostly cocaine and uh, weed uh, when I was younger. Then like he'd pick up like a big trash bag full of like bricks of weed, and I'm just like, you know, I I didn't really I didn't really know what, I knew what weed was then. I knew what it was, then, but I didn't understand like the type, the amount of money, the the, the monetary value of weed. Um, and I, I would see him just like bring big trash bags and duffel bags back and forth from one place to another. One time I, I remember my dad, I walked in on him like chopping up coke. He was just sitting on the bed, just chop, chopping it up because when you first buy it, like it's kind of hard and you wanna like smoothing it out. A lot of times when my dad would take me to like his clientele, they, they were really friendly. So I wasn't really, I didn't understand like the dangers or all of that stuff that came with the drug life. I just knew I was with my dad. We were going from place to place uh, and I saw what I saw, but I didn't really understand the whole reality of the situation. Glenn's father was a kingpin for lack of better words. He was a kingpin. Uh, you know, he dealt with marijuana, cocaine, drugs, all types of things like that. So right now we're on 60th and Spruce in front of Studio 7, which is a bar lounge my dad used to hang out at. I remember one story he told me he got into like a, a, a shootout outside the bar. He got into an altercation with someone else inside the bar. Uh, when, it, when time came for him to leave, he said he was getting inside the car. And all he heard was like the guy like start like a couple shots set off. And he said one bust the back of the window out and went through the car and almost hit him. He said he got out the car, just like shooting back at him in the street. And he said he saw him like hit the ball and he said he just got back in the car and like sped off. And before he ever told me, he said he never used his gun except for that one time. My cousin Richard. He was shot on 49th Street, which is two blocks over from where we live. We heard the gunshots sitting in the living room, nine gunshots. My cousin was shot seven times inside of a house on 49th Street, and we heard it. But we didn't know that was my cousin until he called. He survived. Thank God he survived. You know, next thing you know, you see a car slow rolling down the block, windows drop a little bit, and they let off. Let off about 16 shots, 17, and I got hit with six of them. I hit my stomach three times, my back once, and my thigh, and another bullet went straight through me. Beginning of my 11th grade year where I was, I was stuck in between who do, who do I want to be, like I was lost with my identity. Do I want to be like this, this smart, intelligent guy that everyone likes and get along with, or do I want to be like this cool kid you know, hit the scene with the girls, you know, smoke weed and be like, you know, the, the ultimate badass cool kid. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna be both. University City in ninth grade, I don't think Glenn passed one class his ninth grade year. I mean, we were really worried about him. He was cutting class. Um, he was frequently um, cursing out teachers and leaving the classroom. Many times I would go visit him at the school and we couldn't find him. He'd be, he'd be on the roll as if he checked in in the morning, but teachers hadn't seen him all day. I would find him maybe in a stairwell, walking around the school building. And so he was, again, avoiding work.
My mom saved me from that lifestyle because she she kept a word in my ear. She constantly told me, yo, you, can, you cannot hang out with these people. They are not doing the same thing as you. You can't hang out with them because you could get into trouble just for something that they did, or even worse, lose your life over something they did. Uh, in addition to that, my daughter saved my life because at the same time, I knew that I wanted to be out in the streets, so I sought my daughter as an opportunity to take myself out the streets. That it became from having no excuse to having an excuse like, yo, bro, I can't come out right now because I gotta, I'm chilling with my daughter. I gotta, my, her mom not here, I gotta, she's staying with me. Which my, my daughter did live with me for her first year. Uh, after she was born. Right here is my house. This is where I lived at for the past like six or seven years of my life. It's been both good and bad. You see it, it sits right next to an abandoned house. A possum actually, so my room is, is kind of on, on a border right here. And like a possum scratched a hole through my wall. <laughs> One day I came in my room and his hand was just sticking through the hole that uh, he scratched through. Yeah. Really, on the other hand, I, I do appreciate like the sense of community that, that my block has. My mom was like popular around here. A lot of people knew, knew who she was. A lot of people know who I am. Tell Flynn I said, what's up? Hey Flynn, this is a shout out for you, bro, bro. Fuck with me. So right now we're at my house in West Philly. Uh, I'm gonna take you back to show you the area where my mom slept in. Right now my brother sleeps in here. It was pretty rough uh, when a day came to clear it out. I think it was my cousin and brother who uh, bagged up her clothes and everything. Got all her things from out the dressers. So this is like pretty much what's left after a year. Right here, uh, she, my mother, she was cremated. And this is a box that hold her ashes uh, on the inside of it. And it's a funny feeling because it's not how a lot of people would think that it's a constant agony from losing a parent. It's like a spontaneous feeling. And you randomly have these down days. But some days you just wake up and don't really feel good. You know, but it's not anything that's every day. It just randomly comes. So one day, I may be sitting, talking uh, with my girlfriend or someone, and just anything that reminds me of my mom, it, it brings like a, a well of emotions over me. Miss Casey was in pain almost every day I saw her. Um, she, had, she had mental health issues. She also had a lot of physical impairments. There were times where I went to the house to work with Glenn and he had to walk me back to her bedroom because she couldn't get out of the bed. But in all the pain that she was in, no matter how much pain she was in, she always lit up and smiled when she talked about Glenn. And she talked about how he's gonna do great things. She just always instilled that in him. And I think because of her, that's where we saw, that's why Glenn was able to make the progress he made because she sought the services that he needed. Um, she made sure that when he was in school, she was communicating with his teachers, making sure that he was doing what he was supposed to be doing once he got into high school. A lot of times, parents could kind of lose hope on a child like Glenn because of the behaviors that he exhibited for so long. 
but she, she instilled and continued to be confident that he was going to make it, and he did. Um, you know, when she, when she went to his graduation, I was at his graduation uh, from University City High School, and it was, a, it was the last graduating class for that school before they closed it. And to see the joy in her face as she um, watched him walk down the aisle, and to see Glenn when he got to the top of the aisle and he just started crying, um, the emotions just overtook him as he walked down the aisle. And I think at that moment is when he realized, I never thought I was going to make it, and, and he did. A lot of the trauma that Glenn went through definitely attributed <clears throat> to the behaviors he was exhibiting. He had so much anger. Um, he had seen so many people fail and so many people not make it. And there was definitely a point where it seemed like he didn't think he was going to make it. He wasn't going to get out of the hood. He was going to either be on the corner, um, either dead or in jail. Trauma is an overwhelming feeling or sense of stress um, that overwhelms your capacity c to cope. So you can think about it as an injury to your psyche. Kids who experience, who, who experience traumatic events, particularly at early ages in their life, um, have, are at increased risk for negative outcomes throughout their life course. As they transition into adolescence, into an adulthood, those kids are at increased risk for mental health problems and further involvement in the criminal justice system. Um, poverty. These experiences even place them at risk for physical illness. So things like uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and even early mortality. Studies show that individuals who have had significantly traumatic events when they were young, their, their average life expectancy can decrease by as many as 20 years. Part of it, part of it I, I would say is definitely a, uh, a feeling of survivor's guilt. Because a lot of my friends from around here, like, yeah, you was the only one that made it really from around this way. I was having a conversation with my cousin earlier when, yeah, right here, uh, when we were walking to the train. And he was just telling me, like, I'm in, I'm in a better position than a lot of people coming from the same area as me, you know, and that I'm lucky. Glenn. What's up, Glenn? You to do the things that I do and see the things that I see, you know? Well, I got a lot of opinions on that. First, because is when, when you say black on black crime, it, you kind of like under you kind of forget that like it's a geographical aspect to it. Because, so I study urban studies uh, as my primary major. I have a minor in political science, business, economics, and public policy. It's a spatial it's a problem and not like a racial issue. I was the first person to go to college in our third person in our entire family to go to college. An entire family, cousins, brothers, uncles, aunts, all of that. My mom didn't go to college, none of that. My brothers don't even got high school diplomas. And for me to be going to an Ivy League school for my family was something that was like unimaginable and for free. So this semester I'm just taking a couple courses to fulfill some requirements. Uh, one is a science course called uh, Intro to Geology, Life Through Time. I'm taking another course called Transformation of Urban America. Um, we just like study, study like political and economic changes inside the city. Uh, and I'm also taking a writing seminar. And lastly, I'm taking um, The Color of Laughter, which is one of my free, favorite classes. Uh, we just, it's, it's like an introduction to African American literature course. Uh, and we just study comedy and uh, in conversation with uh, African American literature. And you know how, how white people get so fascinated when a young black nigga from the hood make it to a white space. So people find fascination in that type of stuff. So it's just like, ah. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, we out, bro. I'm the type of student to, I, I tend to overthink things a lot. And I think that's what kind of keeps me on my A game. Uh, just my second class of the day, uh, ge geology, earth through time. So, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so doing things perfect all the time is something that I'm really obsessed with. I was at the school when he received one of his report cards, and uh, he, he got his report card, and there was a B on the report card, and he was livid. He was upset. He said, there's no way I didn't get a B in this class. This is a mistake. I want to go talk to the teacher right now. I said, Glenn, calm down, calm down. Let's, I'll walk with you. We'll go talk to the teacher. So we're walking down the hall, and the whole time he is just irate about a B being on his report card. And we see the teacher who gave him the B down at the other end of the hall. And he stops and he says, Glenn, don't worry about it. It was a mistake. You shouldn't have gotten a B. It was an A, I'm going to change it, before Glenn even got one word out of his mouth. So that's the, that's the jump that he made from ninth grade to 11th grade. He was straight A's, he was on all types of boards, he was speaking at engagements in front of uh, corporate executives, um, he was accepting awards, um, donations for the school and presenting speeches. He just really took on that responsibility. What do you want to be when you're older? Yeah, so I want to get involved in the political side of like education. I want to be the head of the Department of Education someday. Um, if not, then I, w I would definitely like to be a superintendent of a school district and manage school districts. Sir, I need you guys to take out pen and paper so you can copy down some things that you hear that sounds familiar. Six out of 100 said yes, that it was a significant. I'm currently teaching a 10th grade and 9th grade English course for the Silverman Fellowship, which is an undergraduate fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. So when I come around, what, what am I going to hear? Reading and what else? Questions and discussion. Like you're a person that, come in, that comes in close contact with the students on a daily basis while the students are in the classroom. You're their mentor, you're their father, you're their mother. You're everything to them. Underline it and talk about it, man. That's what I want to hear when I come back. Glenn is a very interactive teacher. He comes, brings to the table his experiences with the students. So he doesn't hide anything from them and all the kids just love him. They like ask me, when's Mr. Glenn coming back? And I'm like, oh, like he'll he'll be back. Like, don't worry. Like, he comes every you know two days. <laughs> and they're just taken by him. Philadelphia's public schools have lurched from one budget crisis to the next. 700 teachers were laid off. 23 schools closed. Years of spending beyond uh, what the district was taken in. Welcome to the school district of Philadelphia.
University of University of City High School. Good evening, everyone. My name is Glenn Casey, and I'm a senior at University of City High School. Um, my name is Glenn Casey, and I'm from University of City High School, and I'm the vice president. We're not fighting to keep our school building open. We're fighting to preserve the culture within it. Now, how can we reserve this passion so we create a better education system for all of us? So after I graduated high school in 2013, the school district shut my school down due to massive uh, budget crises that they were uh, going through at the time and still are going through, uh, which is like a part of like uh, the, the bigger urban narrative. Among the various strategies that the district came up with to deal with the budget deficit was closing schools. And uh, the University City High School location is probably one of the most valuable pieces of property of any of the schools that were proposed to be closed because of its location near the universities in an economic development zone. Now we, we are in uh, University City, uh, West Philadelphia. And what you have right here is like basically a demolition of a Drew Middle School. And my school is next. I'm actually, I'm dreading the day to like walk by and see my school not there anymore. Um, it's just like I have a really, really unique bond with my, my school. It, it, it's done a lot for me, so to see it tore down is, it's like kind of like t t taking a part of me, so. It, it's like kind of speechless. When I realized I wanted to go to college, it was through the experiences that I had working with uh, the Student Success Center and Leaders of Change. And I felt like that in essence, it was just like a collection of experiences that kind of spiral into what I've become uh, today. A lot of the school's support staff has been cut and a lot of the budgets that fund the various grant programs have also been cut. And on top of that, um, because of the budgetary crisis and the loss of many of the services and supports that we know many of these kids need is, is a further trauma to them. And there are other students out there, many Glenn Casey's in the making, that can't access these resources because they're no longer there. Uh, my mom, so, so my school, my mom was the first person to graduate from my school. I was the last person to graduate. She graduated in 73. I graduated in 2014, I'm mean, at 2013. So like the school hasn't even been there that long. Well, had I dropped out of school, my mom would have been disappointed. Before she died, she said, when I die, like don't, like don't let this stop you from doing what you're doing. Like my mom was always the type of person to accept death, so. She was like, she was ready. I just want to make sure you're ready. I hate reading literature, dog. Hey, yo, big fish, little palm. That's the type of shit I'm on. Swimming through a sea of sharks. Gotta keep my flippers on. Open water, meaning anything goes. These little minnows want to nibble, biting all of my toes. We so fresh from Atlantic to Pacific, kid. But I know there's always going to be a bigger fish. Still growing to the surface from a bottom dweller. My crew coming up, bubbling like Alka-Seltzer. Whale of a storyteller, legend like Jonah. I'll have a Guinness and for her, a Corona. When I'm feeling blue, I like 
like my seaweed green man i stay high still i go deep like a submarine upstream you can find me west coasting from the creek to the lake to the river to the ocean to each his own ain't no maps or a route life's a beach so i try to keep the sand out my suit i've been told that i didn't have what it takes getting older no longer a baby face out of place but i know i'm on the right path when i leave tell my girl i'll be right back I've been told that I didn't have what it takes Getting older, no longer a baby face Out of place, but I know I'm on the right path When I leave, tell my girl I'll be right back Worn through the storm, that's the type of shit I'm on Toronto, Vancouver, New York to Saskatchewan Doing well on this highway to hell New sneaks on my feet and my suitcase swelled But all well, in the end, none of that matters <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 